Oh, shalom, shalom, Rastafari. Ten bet salam, Shabbat shalom. Now, this is the, uh, I gotta clear, I have to clear the board up here. This is the 39th um, sabbatical Sabbath uh, parsha, the kufa, the reading and feeding, and here we're gonna refer to the Ben Midbar, or Bar Midbar, Ben Midbar or a portion right here. Now, this is, as we mentioned right here in our disclaimer, the views that are presented in this uh, volume are not our own and do not necessarily, speaking about, based on this publication right here, do not necessarily reflect um, the Ethiopic or the Ethiopian Hebraic interpretation of the Old Testament or the Ethiopic or read the Torah in particular. But, it's being compiled here in these five volumes, and so far we have four of them available, and is working to complete the fifth one. The fifth one is basically available, but just tweaking some of the um, some of the errors in, in it, some of the pictures didn't show up so far, and so on. Even the pictures of some of the Eurocentric pictures, but the Holy Spirit says our people need to be informed about what is, as the prophet said. Um, of the New Testament apostle actually said um, concerning concerning the the the, 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 the the Torah. No, I'm just thinking about just thinking about something right there concerning the um um that he would raise up a people who are no people. You know, this whole it, it kind of connects once again to the Gentile issue. The, the so-called Gentile, what's a Gentile? And one of the brethren had said, you know, that the difference with, uh, say, a Gentile, say, in Rastafari and a Gentile in um, the Ethiopian uh, World Federation or the Ethiopian Hebraic community or that Federation sort of idea. In other words, a Gentile doesn't only mean a European in the fullness biblical sense, in the latter day sense, yes, we can say a Gentile would refer to a one who is non black. You understand? But we have to also define these terms and I I said from a couple of vids earlier that we're gonna focus a few videos just on that particular issue because there's a lot of confusion around that particular issue. And this is what has stagnated or cause a type of inertia to the real movement of Ras Tefari. And it's all based on and clarified in our divine heritage. And that is based on the teaching of His Imperial Majesty and the dissemination of our ancient Ethiopian culture, language and culture. The language is the key, really the key to our culture. We have our own testimonies as well. So what we're learning in this is what is the testimony at large? And is it correct if we now study this and do we see this as being an accurate interpretation of the, the scripture or the context of the scripture? So, in making that mention, we also publish documents like this right here. Documents like the Queen of Sheba and Only Son Minulik, right? And we had some back notes um, right here where we say that the Kivrin Neges is a remarkable mixture or fusion of pre Masoretic biblical texts, Hebraic legends, African, Judeo Christian traditions. Yes, we have African, to say black, Judeo Jewish, as well as black Christian traditions, which are original, which have no part of the Europeans coming in and colonizing or a white Jew, European Jew passing through and making a village turn Jewish. That's not, that's not how, that's not how it has happened. And that's not the truth of the matter. And, but a lot of folks would think so when we say we are black Jews, just to use that, or Jude Judaites, Judaic. They'll think, oh, it's because you're trying to be like white folks because they don't know our story and probably don't fully really know their own story. But this is for us to learn the half of the story that hasn't been told until now. 
Hallelujah, all praise be to the King of Kings in the name of our Black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. So now some of these are historical and some are of a so-called mythic, mythic quality. Now even the word mythology needs to be clarified because a lot of folks, when you say mythology, when we say that the only way to understand or to properly understand the Bible, you understand, in its context, you have to be familiar or acquainted with the ancient mythology. Some people think you're talking about fiction. But the modern mythology is the worst form of myth. Is the worst form of myth because it's not even based on humanity. It's really based on, we can say, Hollywood or it's based on, you know, the media or it's based on a handful of people who are putting across a certain worldview that for lack of a better, you know, lack for a lack of a better description to us, people of faith is satanic. You understand? But then to them, we are satanic. To them, we are their opposition. You, you understand? So to the good, you understand? Um, to the good, uh, the evildoers are evil. But then to the evildoers, the good are considered evil. So when people talk about hate, hate speech and haters, it's very interesting how that's used in a modern mythological sense. But a myth basically is a story. If you were to look up the word myth from a biblical, even the um, Strong's Concordance, and look into the Hebrew lexicon, and look, look into Thaler's, Thaler's lexicon as well, and Jesenius, so forth and so on, you will find that the word myth, when you trace it back to its original origin, links up with the word mystery, as we have a, the mystery of God in Christ. And then there's another mystery that we have as well, and this mystery is the mystery of iniquity. And these mysteries, the word says, in the latter days and time, the fulfillment of this cycle, the whole 2012 and beyond, in the fulfillment of these cycles, the mystery of God in Christ would be known. And there will be other mysteries too, things that were hidden, secret, people didn't understand what's the connection of that will become known. I mean, we can even say with the internet and the media and, and, and the ability now for ones to share their own studies and research and it's not controlled by like three corporations so much, even though they are diligently seeking to censor and control the media, it's not there just yet. You understand? It's not there as of yet. So it's fulfilling God's word in the book of Daniel that knowledge shall go to and fro, you know, information shall increase, knowledge shall go to and fro. Now, these, um, these works right here, I find them to be very, very important when we start to really go to the next level of our Torah studies. Now, this one right here is the Ethiopic Legends of Our Lady Mary. And now, we, we, we produce this in two, two versions or two covers. This is the blue and white right here, right? This is the blue and white. And there's another gold and black where this been the Marium and Jesus, the child, um, in this uh, iconic image would be in gold and the background would be in black. So, you know, that particular choice is there, you know, for those who, who, who choose it. So, for um, I and I, we just choose the blue and white for right now, but others might prefer the black and, 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 the, and the gold you know, for whatever particular reasons, go get a copy. The main thing is not so much the cover. Don't judge a book by its cover, but it's the content. What is the content therein? So these particular books are very, very important, and hopefully in this Torah portion, reading and feeding, we might be able to connect some of the half of the story concerning it. And, and, and this particular Torah portion is really, really significant because in it, um, Miriam, Miriam is called Hukat, Hukat, Hukat. Now Hukat and the good is come from Hak or Hig. Hig come from Hukat and Hukat come from Hig. These are related words. Actually, the Hebraic, the modern Hebraic and the Hebrew was derived from the ancient Egyptian and the ancient Ethiopic. So when we go to the ancient Ethiopic, being an Afro-Shemitic language, we get to the very roots. 
of that matter. So we're going to refer to some of these documents as much as we can right now um, because there's a lot that's in here. And we found something in, in this on page 22 of the Ethiopic legend, Legends of Our Lady Mary, that kind of helps us in the teaching of this particular portion where Miriam, the sister of Moshe, of Musa, she dies, as well as Haron, Aaron, and Aaron Ha'aron, his name means the ark. His name means ark. One can also um, interpret like an, an illumination or an effluence, effluence, uh, effluence of light, so to speak. But simply his name refers to ark. The Aaron, the Ha'aron is the ark. All right? i.e. Ark of the Covenant in the Hebraic. Ethiopically, we call it the Tabot. Yet the Tabot in the Hebrew, that was the Ark that Moses was put in, you understand? And you know the role that his sister, his older sister Miriam played in that particular incident. So these are our reference points. This is why we, we, we focus on these documents like the Kibber and the Guest or the Queen of Sheba and only son Minulik. You understand? They help us as we go through it. They help us in, in various different ways to see the ancient context as well as the interpretation of various um, stories, legends, and portions of the scripture in, in, in much the same way that the, 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 the Jews or the Jews who call themselves Jews utilize the Talmud, Yovasan, the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Haggadah, and the Haggadiot, or the, 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 the different stories that they utilize, which are basically compilations of ancient wisdom. Yovasan, and some of this wisdom, even in the, the Judaic, and much of it in the Judaic, actually comes from the ancient the ancient native black Hebrews. You understand? We spoke on that before in another Torah portion, another teaching, when there's a part in the book of Kings when all the Israelites were taken into Babylon and the king of Babylon brings in a new population into that region who are not Israelites. And the people have a lot of trouble in the land. Lions are coming out of nowhere and eating them up and so forth and so on. So they complain to the king who brought in all these foreign peoples, you understand, um, into the land of the native Israelites who then went into captivity in Babylon because of disobedience, right, because of disobedience. Now, we think that the Israelites, our Israelitish ancestors who went into Babylon, it was because they were worshiping idols, so forth and so on. And that's not to say that they wasn't worshiping idols, so forth and so on. But the main reason that the scriptures give for the captivity of the Beit Israel is because the land, the land did not enjoy her Shabbat, did not enjoy her times of rest. The land was exhausted, was worn out. Now, you can make a link with the woman and the femininity and the matriarchy and there's a very very important link in that that's why I and I personally take it as a fence when one say oh because we're speaking out on how the image of the black woman has been has been um, demonized has been degraded has been destroyed in this in this Babylon one say that we hate women so forth and so on well, let's say it like this. We hate evil women. You, you know what I mean? We hate evil among men. E evil is to be repulsed. You understand? While goodness and truth is to be attracted. You understand? These are the basic physics or forces, you know, the, the, the phykesis. This is the phykesis. And, you know, in that as well is a high science. You know, there's a science in that. It, it, it can be measured. You understand? There's a realness to it. Some say it's belief. Some say this is religion. So forth and so on. Well, how interesting the people you understand, who highly regard this are said to be, in a sense, 
at the rulership of all nations. So the so-called Jews, they say the Jews control blah, 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 so forth and so on. It's not because of the Jews so much, but it's because they at least regard what really is really important with the one whom we all have to do. In other words, the Almighty God. Now, true, there are apostates amongst them, too. And may they take care of the apostates in their fold as we have to take care of the, the, the wolves and the sheep clothing in our own fold. And it's the truth. You understand? It's the truth. Both the preaching, proclamation, the speaking of it, right, and the acting on it. The acting on it. You understand? That separates. You know, and this Torah portion as well, known as Hukat, Hukat, here's the 39th Torah portion. We said we call it, uh, Bamaringa says, yeah, Higu, Higu is actually Hukat in the Hebrew. The word Hukat, Hak in the Arabic, Hug in the Ethiopic and Amharic refers to, to law in a specialized way. Here's, yeah, Higu, Tizaz, Yehino. Now, the portion to be read and studied is Numbers 19, chapter 19, verses 1 to Numbers chapter 22, verse 1. And the Nabiyat, or the prophetical um, portion, the Nabiyat, or the Haftarah, is Judges chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, because in that particular reading you'll find a recounting or a reference to this wilderness experience. And then the Berit Hadasha which is the New Covenant readings, is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, 9, 11 to verse 28, and John, the Gospel of John, or Johannes, Johannes Wengel, chapter 3, verses 10 to verse 21. That's the full reading in the three, the three parts. So, ideally speaking, you could have about um, three... You could have three readers for this in a congregational gathering. One reader for the Torah portion, another reader for the Haftarah or the Nabiyat portion, the prophetical portion, and a third reader for the New Testament portion or the Burit, the Burit Hadasha or the Hadith Kidan. That's in congregational worship or congregational gathering. Now, if we are if we are like holding the Shabbat meditation or keeping the Shabbat, protecting the Shabbat, in other words, that means that remembering the Sabbath, the, the, the Sabbath, to keep it set apart, we read these ourselves. You understand? And whether singularly or whether with many. And even if you're praying and studying alone in, in true faith, in spirit and in truth, you're not alone. Because the son said, if you keep his words, Yeshua HaMoshi, our black Lord and Savior, he will suck with us and the father will suck. So as the father is with the son, the father and the son will suck with that one. So even by a basic count, you understand, it's the triune God plus I and I. You know what I mean? So, so one is never alone. One has to get out of that kind of, because by saying one is alone, one is saying that the physical reality is the only reality. That means you're in a sense denying your your spirit and your soul. Because your spirit and your, your soul, you don't see it. You know what I'm saying? You don't see your spirit and your soul, do you? You understand? No, but you know or you should know that you have a spirit, soul, and body in that particular order. You understand? So we're dealing with the spiritual. This is true spirituality. So let's get into this in the remaining portion of time we have in this particular recording. Now, we was touching on the Islamic fascist invasion of Target Africa in 2012. Um, we touched on John 10.10 10, uh, about how the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy, kill in the context of murder. We haven't posted that just yet because there's more to touch on that particular situation. But here's what we find to be even a little more mentally interesting. That in this Torah portion, we're dealing with the ancient type of this modern type of Islamo-fascism or this, this Mohammedanism, you understand the so-called pale red, so-called pale and red and red haras, you understand the so-called pale 
and red Arabs and what's going on. And that's really hateful. You want to talk about haters? You want to talk about some hateful deeds and actions? But the but this is being suppressed in the media. What's happened to our African peoples, the hatred that's going on, and even it's a religious kind of a thing. You, you understand? It has a racial dimension in West Africa right now, just like Darfur, just like the Horn of Africa. You understand? All the media speaks about is the European Jews and their concerns, and that's very hateful to I and I. Are they saying that we are not? And therefore, by whose standard? By their own standard? Well, how be it? Our ancient Judaism is about 3,000 to 3,200 years older than theirs, and they have the evidence of that. So let's go into this right here in a moment. Let me pick this up right here. All right. Um, but you can't be lazy. I'm saying spiritually lazy. Let me, let me, because the Bible says the fool have said, and have said in his heart, there is no God. You have to invest in this word. If the only word you have is from TV and movies and popular nonsense, how miserable, you understand, are you? I mean, think about it. It's, and now, folks who, you know, if you're, if you're watching this vid, you understand, this vid is for those who are into this spirituality. You understand the spirituality of the King of Kings and His Christ. You understand? So I'm not saying that y'all are like that, but it's just a point that we have to remind I and I ourselves of. That if we, if you invest in something, you can draw from it. You understand? We have to invest not just in reading the Word, but invest in knowing the Word, as well as invest in acting on the Word. So let's touch on this Torah portion right here within the time we have. So this particular Torah portion is known as, um, yeah, this particular Torah portion is known as, it's called RSS, Rastafari, Sabbatical Study Number 39. And it's called, in the Hebrew, we're going to go to Hebrew first, it's called Hukat. Some put a T-H there, so it looks like Hukat, right? Hukat or Chukat, Chukat. Now in our um, readings and feedings right here, let's give you a synopsis, a brief synopsis right here, all right, a, a summary of this right here. So we have Chukat. Now it said that Chukat means degree, a de decree, decree, like a decree, right? It says it's the ninth word and it's the first distinctive word in the Parsha, Parsha, means portion in the Hebrew. Bamarinya in the heart we say kufa. So in this particular portion. This is the 39th weekly Torah portion, Parsha, in the annual uh, Judaic cycle of Torah readings, or Ritmin Ba Malet. And it's the sixth. This is the sixth in the book of Numbers. This particular Torah um, portion is the sixth in this particular book, the book of Numbers. And it constitutes Numbers chapter 19, verses 1, to Numbers chapter 22, verse 1. Now, we as black Jews and other Jews and Hebrews, faithful ones who, who practice, practice the, the spiritual liberty in the diaspora, we generally read it in late June or July. And so, therefore, this is what going into the, the 6th to 7th. So, this is July 7th, 2012 now. There's a note here about the Luni Solar Hebrew calendar that contains up to 55 weeks, the exact number varying among years. In most years, for example, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, Parsha Chukat is read separately. So it's kind of interesting that in this particular time, in this particular dispensation that we're in, these particular years from 2010, to 2017, that this portion is read separately. Now, in some years, for example, in 2009, Parsha Hukat is combined with the subsequent Parsha Balak, Balak, to help achieve the needed number of weekly readings. That means so that 
all of the readings within the cycle of Torah readings would be complete. So there's a particular discipline, there's a spiritual discipline. But now, in that spiritual discipline, what many of us are beginning to recognize is that Jah, Yah, the God and Father, our Black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, HaMoshiach, is speaking to us. So there's certain things that we're able to, while we read this for this week portion, this, this weekly portion, this Shabbat or Senbet portion, we're seeing the word Christ speaking to us, the Moshiach speaking to us about the circumstances that we're dealing with in 2012. And Jah willing, hopefully we'll be able to make a couple examples um, or at least testify to some of that. Now, we as uh, Hebrews, as ethnic Hebrews or, 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 or Jews, and Judahites of Moa Anbesa, the Imen Negeda Yehuda, and the line of Judah society of his imperial majesty, we also read the first part of the portion, the Parsha, Numbers chapter 19, verse 1 to 22, in addition to the regular weekly Torah portion on what's known as the Shabbat after Purim which is called Shabbat, the Shabbat Para. Shabbat Para. What happens on Shabbat Para? A reader chants. Keyword, chants. They're doing, doing chanting and singing. The reader chants the regular weekly Torah portion first, and then a reader chants the chapter of the red cow chapter of the red cow, yep, para aduma, para aduma, para aduma means red cow, in other words, in the Hebrew. Shabbat para, it occurs shortly before Pesach, or Fasika, it occurs shortly before Passover, and Numbers chapter 19, verses 1 to verse 22, this sets out what we know, what we call the procedure the procedure by which the Beta Israel could purify themselves from the contamination that was caused by a corpse. In other words, a corpse, a dead body, causes a contamination. Not just because the person is dead or anything personal, but we have to also put it in the context of the culture and in the context of the time. It's like now, if someone passes away or dies, they got the morgue, they got refrigeration, so forth and so on. They understand more about the whole science of things. You know what I'm saying? Therefore, that prevents, you know, contamination. There's real contamination. So let's recognize they're going through the wilderness, which is like a desert. You know, was just the other day they had this tragic, shocking, wicked story about allegedly a man who killed him who killed his, his, his woman and, and I think uh, a cousin or a, niece and a nephew or someone who uh, you know, wasn't their child, but it was a man, woman, and child were found dead. And they said it was some party, I think on the Shabbat, you know, well, not for them, it was a Saturday party. And then Sunday people started to smell stuff, but Saturday's party was really, really loud. And then it was like Monday or so, when people started to smell you understand? So to smell, we could say the, the stinking, the rottening flesh, you understand, um, of the dead bodies. And they said there were flies and everything else. Now, think about it. If you're going through a wilderness, right, and some people happen to die, you don't have a morgue or no place, there's no refrigeration or whatnot like that. What do you do? So this teaches us what the Beta is Arayel what our ancestors had to do in that particular time in the context of the, the culture of the particular time. So let's, let's read and let's understand this. So they had to purify themselves from the contamination caused by a corpse. And so prepare, and so prepare, the key word is, well, well, hakshara, the key word is prepare for the pilgrimage festival of Passover of Pesach. In other words, Passover is a pilgrimage festival. What does that mean? That means that we get up and we journey, you understand, to the place where Jah's name is set. You understand? 
for example, for I and I, that would be a pilgrimage, you know what I'm saying, to Ethiopia. That would be a pilgrimage, you could say, to Addis Ababa. You know what I'm saying? In that context, if we were um, fulfilling fully our birthright, you know what I'm saying, and living within the terms of the covenant, you know what I'm saying, or the terms of the contractual agreement between God and man in our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, otherwise known as Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christos, according to the Ethiopic. So, they had to prepare for the pilgrimage festival, the Maheja, the Maheja festival, one of the Shalosh, the Shalosh Regalim, the Shalosh Regalim in Hebrew, or the three Regalim, pilgrimages, reg Regal in the Arabic is Rejal, Rejlum is, is like the foot. Basically, it means that they walk, they journey. And if you know the Psalms or are familiar with the Psalms, some of the Psalms are what's, not, you know, what's called the Psalms of Ascent, the Mesmur of Ascent. You understand the Mesmur of going up. Because while they were going up, you understand to Holy Mount um, Zion and to Jerusalem, you know, certain Psalms would be chanted. So when you understand that and you're reading it, you can see the context. You know, in the context of it. And that makes the word now like high definition. The word now becomes like HD. You know what I mean? High definition. So the summary of this right here is in this particular Torah portion, the 39th Torah portion known as Hukat, we have eight matters. There are eight, you could say, eight separate scenes, important scenes in this Torah portion. There's eight of them. The first is the red heifer, or the para aduma, the para aduma, the red heifer, the red cow, right? The red heifer, the red cow. Secondly is Miriam's, Miriam's death. Miriam, who was the sister of Moshe. You remember the scene with the baby being put into the um, the ark, you understand, and put into the Nile, the, the basket of bulrushes, the Tebet in the Hebrew, we call it Tabot, Bamarinya, and in the Gutters, and put into that and sailed down the Nile, and then that particular boy, Moshe, Moshe, drawn from the waters, was adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh. Well, that Miriam, you understand, she dies here. The same Miriam that, because she, she had a problem with Moses' Ethiopian wife, it wasn't a racial problem, it was a cultural problem. You have to understand, it was a cultural problem. It wasn't that, oh, Miriam was, was white. She became white when John cursed her with leprosy because of her her bad heart, her mixed up mood and attitude to Moses' Ethiopian wife. You understand to Moses' Ethiopian wife. So this should be a, a, a word of warning even to our modern Hebrew Israelites, black Hebrew Israelites, who seem to be totally ignorant of the Ethiopian connection. If they really studied Torah, you understand, then it would become very clear. The, the fullness, the context of, of what we're saying, but moreover what the scriptures, what the will of Yah, what the will of Yahweh and Yeshua, HaMoshiach, really is for I and I. So the second matter is Miriam's death. The third matter is the water from the rock. Remember the rock being struck by Moses? And in the New Testament we learn that that rock is Moshiach. The rock that was struck actually is Moshiach, right? Interesting. Fourthly is the emissary. There was an emissary to Edom, to Edom. Edom, Esau, Hazars, yes. The fifth matter is Aaron's death. Aaron also died. So sister and brother both die in this particular Torah portion, basically leaving, leaving Mashu, um, Musa, Moses alone, right? 
The sixth matter is the victory over a place and a people known as Arad. 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 Right? The seventh matter is serpents. Is serpents. Serpents. The eighth matter is the victories of the Beta Israel and the Beta Israel armies over Sihon and Og. Sihon and Og. Now, that's very interesting, too, because we just took down some of the stuff about the Islamo fascists. What was very, very interesting, and even some of our um, European Jewish cousins, they've been picking up on that, too, the connection of this Islamo a fascist, this kind of Mohammedanism connection with Esau, with Esau from, now we would say that, well, they got some connection with Esau as well, but if they're in the covenant, at least they're on the right side of the family. You understand, in other words, if, if, they, if they are those crypto, the crypto characters, well, you, you know, you know what the word says, and we know that we say, amen, amen, it will be. So, these eight these eight, these eight, these eight right here. Let's let's put this up here for y'all. Let's go through this. One, right, one was the red the red heifer. Right? The red heifer. Two is Miriam's death. Right? Miriam's death. Three is water. Right? Water from a rock. Well, really, the rock is Christ, but we're just going to go according to what we have here. Um, emissary, an emissary, emissary to Edom, right, to Edom, right? The fifth matter, right, is Aaron's, right, Aaron's death, right? The sixth matter, right, is the victory over... Arad, I hope we have enough room here, right? The seventh matter, and just barely, is the serpent, the fiery ser serpent, whom the scriptures, I think, if I'm correct, call them the seraphim, or the seraphim. And seraphim, it's interesting when we make that Egypt connection right here. And now the eighth matter, which is last but not least, is the victories, right, the victories, right, over, right, Sihon, or Sihon and Oak, right, Sihon and Oak. So these are the matters, this is a summary of this 39th Rastafari Sabbatical study or Torah portion known as Hukat, Hukat, or Yehigu. Tizaz Yihno in the Revised and Hard Bible or or the Empress according to the Empress Nagusa Neges Bible, the line of Judah Bible, Revelation five and five Bible. Right? So we're gonna to touch on these portions right here. Now the red heifer can be a whole each one of these should be. And we haven't as of yet did a, like a lecture like that where we take it each one. Okay, red heifer. Let's talk about the red heifer. Miriam's death. Let's go into what's the significance of Miriam's death. Water from a rock. A whole, a whole, a whole series can be touched on that because the rock is Christos. The rock is Christ. Now in our Schofield study Bible. Right, the discipleship Bible in English, the Schofield Study Bible. What do we have here under the red heifer? There's a whole paragraphical footnote right there, which is very, very important to take the veil. Make sure no veil is on your eyes in the reading of Moses, in the reading of Mashu, of Musa, because it says that the Jews, because they rejected. Our people and other foolish ones of our own people, as the Kibbutz and the Geddes says foolish Jews, and that's not being anti-Shemitic to say that because we as Ethiopians are Shemitic. You know what I'm saying? Now, if one disagrees, they, they have right to disagree, but 
you can't disagree with the evidence because the evidence is indisputable. So what they choose to do is avoid that evidence and continue to, you know, run another kind of a game on us if they can. Now, the rock is Christ. The rock is Christ, right? And then we have the victories of the march of Israel, right? The march of Israel. We have the serpent of brass. Remember, this is the brazen. These are the brazen serpents, and the solution to that was the, the serpent of brass, or one would call it the medical symbol. We see the medical symbol. The medical symbol now that most people are familiar with, it comes out of this serpent of brass. Then there are two more victories, right, over the Amorites, you know, Sihon and Og, that complete this particular um, Torah portion. So we should begin, no doubt, with first things first. Now, beginning with the first things first, I see a connection, actually, in a sense, in these three right here, these first three, the red heifer, the, the para duma, Miriam's moat, her death, and thirdly, water from a rock, and that rock, right, the rock, the hadith kidan, the Burit Chadasha, the New Covenant tells us that that rock is Moshiach. That Moshiach, Yeshua, is that rock. And it's a beautiful connection and overstanding if you can receive it. Many of our so-called Jewish people, our Judah, Judah-ish people, our Judaic people, our Israelite people, even some of our own people over here who are Hebrew Israelites, there is a, the same thing the Bible actually speaks about this. There's almost a veil over their eyes when they are reading Moses. And we keep focusing on that particular matter because some say, hey, why are you reading into the Old Testament? The Old Te it's not about the Old Testament, it's about the New Testament. And we could not agree with you more. But what did the Moshiach, what did the Yesus, what did Christ say? I have not come to do what? To destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. Now, fulfill doesn't mean like, like it, it, it's destroyed, it's no more, it's ended. He didn't come to end it. He came to fulfill it so that now we can look at this, the Old Testament, and really see, well, what is this red heifer about? So, so why did they have to create this water of separation thing? How does that connect with Yeshua? And moreover, as a Christian or as a Rastafari with the new name, how does this affect or reflect upon I and I? And that is where the mystery of God and, and, and His Christ is revealed to us. And that is really the beauty of it. And when you start to study it from that sort of perspective, that's when you begin to recognize as as a few of I and I have recognized, and many others have recognized, 